Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to Third Thursdays, Our Stories, Ourselves, which is a collaboration between the San Jose Museum of Art and Play on Words. And uh, my name is Robin Treen, and I'm with the San Jose Museum of Art, and I'm here with Julia and Melinda, who you're gonna hear a little bit more about shortly. Uh, we're so pleased to be working with Play on Words again. Uh, of course, all of our past collaborations have been in person at the museum. So tonight is their very first virtual program. <laughs> the museum has ventured into the online world, but Play on Words has not yet. So this is their first. So everybody, I hope will give them a very warm welcome and uh, be kind because this is not easy as they're finding out. Um, but in any event, this is their first virtual program and hopefully next year, we'll all be back in the museum together when things are a little bit more normal, maybe better than normal, we hope. So, but in the meantime, I did wanna let everybody know that the museum is currently reopened, although not fully, um, but we are reopened Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 to five. So we have some wonderful new exhibitions. We hope that you will uh, come and see. And as the San Jose and everybody begins to reopen a little bit, other events are slowly coming back to the downtown area as well. So I'm sure everybody's heard that San Jose Jazz's Summerfest will be happening in it again this year, a smaller version, but we're very happy to be hosting one of their stages and that will be on August 13th, 14th and 15th. So I hope everybody will uh, look for that coming up as well. So um, tonight's program is offered uh, called Our, Body, Our Stories Ourselves and is offered in conjunction with Immigrant Heritage Month, which is an annual event every June and celebrates our collective identities, both individually and as a nation of immigrants. And so um, the stories you're gonna hear tonight are all reflecting in some way on our background as as an immigrant nation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Play on Words and introduce um, Julia Halperin Jackson and Melinda Marks. And they're gonna tell you a little bit more, a lot more about Play on Words so you don't have to hear it from me. And with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us, Robin. Leg. <laughs> We're here. We made it here. <laughs> break a leg, break a leg. <laughs> yes, thank you. And thank you to everyone who is making the show tonight possible. This was a true community effort between um, the 16 writers that we've been working with, as well as the uh, nine actors that are performing tonight, um, some of them in person and some of them um, in recording. So this is this was a real community effort. And um, as a collaborative literary arts series, we've existed in San Jose since 2013. And uh, like Robin said, typically we do this in person <laughs> um, in a beautiful space like the museum. And uh, the way we work is we take uh, submissions of original fiction, nonfiction, theater, and poetry. And tonight we have our first work in translation. Um, and then we pair them with professional actors for live performances. So the experience is meant to both uh, elevate the voice of the writer and uh, and also give them a chance to hear the work interpreted by an actor. So um, it's been a real joy to work on this over the past several years with my producing partner, Melinda. Well, let's speak now. Yeah, Hi, that was Julia. I'm Melinda. Um, where, where Julia um, has done uh, a, a lot of incredible work um, you know, forging a lot of community connections uh, within the Greater Bay Area community. Um, I've uh, done what I can in my capacity as a casting director. So I give um, an eye to the pieces and not only sort of try to figure out, um, you know, how and if to create dynamic performances, uh, but also uh, scout performers um, to be able to pair these pieces. And um, I'm really, I'm really happy and, and proud to say, even though it's literally the, the least we can do uh, as a as an active community member, that not only um, are we very proud to have spent now eight years, um, you know, promoting the Bay Area community and Bay Area local talent, but also really driving um, 
you know, active equity and active inclusion, you know, actively inclusive practices, both in the casting of our pieces and, and in their selection um, to really, you know, highlight uh, what community, all that community is and all that it can be, both in the performance space and in the community at large, which is super important in the Bay Area and, and everywhere. Um, uh, yeah, and so we have some pieces today. Um, the theme for the show in conjunction with the museum is immigrant heritage. Um, we have, uh, among others, uh, many dynamic pieces, an excerpt from Cheney Kwok's new memoir, The Passenger, um, which details uh, his experience on a sinking cruise ship in 2019. We have Camilo Garzon's uh, tribute to uh, the late Sean Monterrosa, who was killed by the Vallejo PD not long after the death of George Floyd. Um, we have other stories representing uh, uh, Pakistan, England, Korea, Japan, Iran, Mexico, more. <laughs> and we'll cap off tonight uh, with an original TED Talk by our youngest contributor ever, Kai Karayama, who um, uh, narrates uh, his own uh, uh, personal experience about his Korean and Japanese ancestry and what it's been like for him to um, be um, an Asian American kid um, during this experience with the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's gonna be a really, uh, a really dynamic and meaningful show. Okay. So yeah, and um, before we jump in, I just want to say thank you again to the museum, to Robin and her team uh, for making this possible. And uh, we hope you enjoy the show. We will be taking a brief five minute um, intermission after the first act and you'll see um, a little countdown ticker on the screen. So that's when you can take a potty break. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so hang in there, enjoy the show. And um, thank you so much everyone for making this possible. Thank you. All right, uh, without further ado, um, we're gonna start off uh, with our first piece. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to, sorry, we're going to begin with a performance by Muesli. Hi, my name is Muesli, he, him pronouns, and I'm going to be reading 70 some years ago by Cheney Kwok. Sometime around 1948, my father, aged six or seven, was in the midst of his own maritime disaster in the making. He was somewhere in the small but unpredictable pocket of the Pacific Ocean between Korea and Japan. He was heading to the homeland he'd never seen. At the end of World War II, my family was among the 2.4 million ethnic Koreans living in Japan. Some were bright-eyed university students, some enthusiastic colonial collaborators, others laborers, conscripted during the three decades of Japanese occupation of Korea. The Kwaks were none of the above. My grandparents had taken the gamble of moving across the strait in search of a better life. They settled in Takarazuka, a sleepy foothill town nuzzled between Osaka and Kobe, unremarkable in every way except for its famous traditional troupe of male impersonating actresses. My grandparents opened a hardware shop and did well for themselves, well enough to have oranges in their pantry during the height of wartime shortages. One of the few fragments of memory my father carried from his foreign birthplace is the neighbors coming by time and again to borrow refined sugar, an indulgence back then, a proud memory perhaps for this family of immigrants. A couple of years after Korea's independence in 1945, the Kwaks joined their compatriots in moving homeward, crossing the sea that, at its narrowest, would take barely a day to navigate. But they didn't have what we would take for granted now, pinpoint navigation, by the minute weather forecasts, rescue helicopters. Nothing was certain. In a world that had become more entangled through wars, journeys had grown shorter, but no less perilous. Take, for example, the Gonron Maru. In 1943, the six-month-old, 7,900-ton ship was sailing to Korea, 
when the American submarine USS Wahoo discharged torpedoes. The US Navy was acting on intelligence that there were 2,000 Japanese soldiers on board, but life being as random as it is, a derailed train had stranded those soldiers on land in Japan. The steamer left anyway, carrying only civilians, traders, migrants, homebound students. More than 580 would perish. The end of the war didn't guarantee safety either. The Ukishima Maru, an auxiliary warship, left a Japanese military base in Aomori at the northern tip of the main island of Honshu one week after the Japanese emperor surrendered. On board were more than 4,000 Koreans, 3,725 of whom were forced laborers, at last free to return home and their families. Two days into the voyage, a little more than halfway through the journey, the ship made a resupplying pit stop in the, po in the port of Maizaru near, Ky near Kyoto. Pulling away from the port for the final leg, the ship struck a magnetic mine. More than 500 passengers drowned just off the shore of their captor's land. Those on board were not the people whom history books honor, just bit players on the chaotic stage that had seen too many anonymous casualties already. I'd never heard of either of those ships or their tragic ends until I began digging around for my own family's history. So it's no surprise that I can't find any historical record of my father's homeward voyage. And can you blame him, then just a child, for not remembering much of the trip, let alone the exact date? My grandparents are gone, and dad's older siblings can't recall the name of their ship either. Perhaps they've all willed themselves into burying the memory. Whatever records they may have had, boarding passes, entry documents, were lost to time. But when I look at that map of Japan, it sends chills down my spine to see that you can draw a straight line north from Takarazuka, where my family lived, to the port of Maizaru, where the mine explosion drowned hundreds of my compatriots. It's very possible that my father also left Japan from Maizaru. A different day, a different fate. Had the Ukishima Maru's course out of Maizaru veered just a few feet differently in 1945, and that's a big if, because some scholars and the victims' descendants believe the explosion was no accident, and had the underwater mine lain dormant and undetected for just a couple of years longer, could the ship carrying my family have been the one happening upon it? No matter how hard we try to make up narratives to explain past events, history seems to me no more logical than it is compassionate. No. My family story unfolded this way. What should have been a quick journey instead stretched on for days as the ship lost its bearings in bad weather and kept drifting down towards the South China Sea. Nothing silky about it. This part gets hazy. The version my dad tells has the ship end up all the way to the Gulf of Tonkin, which seems an impossibly far away distance to go while lost. As the ship ran out of provisions, my grandfather sought out the captain who had eyed his wristwatch. When my father insists that it was an extravagant Patek Philippe watch on my grandfather's wrists, my inner skeptic takes me on a wild internet goose chase. Were there luxury Swiss watches in Japan at the time? During my grandparents' immigrant years, building a business must not have been easy. A Korean in Japan was a second-class citizen no matter how perfectly he spoke Japanese. The imperial Japanese government banned the native language in schools in Korea, which meant any educated person would read and write and curse in the language of the colonizers. Despite the fluency in Japanese, could an ordinary immigrant have done well enough for himself to afford a handmade European watch? Then again, 
embarking on an uncertain homebound journey in that era, long before travel insurance became readily available. Wouldn't you opt for the safest, most compact form of currency to carry on you? And if my father is a reflection of his own father, then I believe in a heartbeat that this man I never met would have always bought the best in class of everything. Besides, if you're leaving a land that has always regarded you as less than equal, who wouldn't want to wear some crazy, ostentatious bling? My grandparents, who'd worked to make certain their children would want for nothing, even at the height of World War II, weren't about to let them go hungry. So, my father's version of the story goes, my grandfather found the master of the ship and traded his prized wristwatch for the last grains of rice on board. Who cares whether it was a Patek Philippe? Let it be a factory made Timex shaped like Mickey Mouse for all I care. The point is this, my grandfather, a man who would die decades before I was born, gave away what was dear to him so that his family could live. Days later, exhausted but not starved, my family landed in Gunsan, on the opposite side of the Korean peninsula from their original destination. My father's first sight of his homeland was of a place his family had never been. Why am I sleep deprived, thirsty, listing side to side on a moaning cruise ship without a working engine, thinking about a second hand past? We are at the mercy of a sea that alternates between quick upsurges and muscular undertoes, ready to capsize any moment now. Why think of my father? Maybe it's because there's no point speculating when your future seems not only uncertain, but also random. I have no way of knowing what will happen in the next minute, much less in an hour, but at least there are some truths upon which I can plant my feet. I suppose this is what faith means to some. For me, knowing where I come from is my gravity. Thank you. Our next piece is Yvette del Toro reading A Carpenter with a Hammer by Camilo Garzon. A Carpenter with a Hammer Dedicated to the memory of Sean Monterrosa I will remember you, Sean Monterrosa. I will remember you for what you are. A carpenter. I will remember you for what you are. Like me. Another Latino in the USA. Those who work, those who build, those who harvest, those who teach. Those who use tools mistaken as weapons by the Vallejo PD, who see us kneeling with a hammer protruding from our pockets, and with a lack of critical thinking, kill us, and justify it by describing us as potential looting suspects whom officers believed were carrying firearms. Five shots through a windshield. All for what? We've heard this story before. It wasn't a firearm. Of course it wasn't a firearm. It was actually a 15-inch hammer. A hammer. The same hammer you used to build other people's houses, to build generational wealth. And on that day, to build a resistance. I will remember your hammer as a tool because you knew, like I do too, that without the fire and brimstone endured by black people, we wouldn't be here today. For it was their action that led to the Immigration Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. 
I'm glad you, Sean, also went to act. I will remember you for what you are. But the point is that you just are. I didn't know you. But I know you didn't deserve to die. A lover of reading. The guy who was always trying to get his best friend to read more. I know that guy because I am that guy too. I will read your name, Sean, and I will remember it. The name of a carpenter with a hammer. Hi, my name is Francesca Loy, and this is Recipe for Hamburgers, 1985, by Keiko O'Leary. Get the teriyaki sauce from the fridge. Only mom knows how to make the teriyaki sauce, and only with her special container. Form the ground beef into patties. Only mom knows how to make the teriyaki sauce, and she calls the ground beef hamburger. Place the patties on the baking pan, already covered in tin foil. Mom calls the ground beef hamburger, and the teriyaki sauce has no sugar. All baking pans are already covered in tin foil. All meat is teriyaki, except for fish. The teriyaki sauce has no sugar. Mom grates ginger and garlic pours sherry and shoyu. All meat is teriyaki except for fish. Mom knows the proportions measured by the container. Mom grates ginger and garlic, pours sherry and shoyu. Pour teriyaki sauce on the patties until it's enough. Mom knows the proportions measured by the container. The kids from school eat hamburgers at McDonald's. Pour teriyaki sauce on the patties until it's enough. Bake the patties until they're done. The kids from school eat hamburgers at McDonald's. Remove from oven, serve with rice. Thank you. Hello. This is Not a Gardener by Melissa Flores Anderson. Teresa looked at the water pooled on the large leaves of the Mexican squash plant from an early fall rain. She inspected the green leaves closely, looking for signs of pests. She'd been battling a cucumber beetle all week, the black spots on its back, the only thing to distinguish from the plants it invaded. When she spotted it again, she carried it to the southern fence line and deposited it over the edge. She was not a gardener. She had killed more house plants than she could count on all her fingers and toes. She would forget to water plants in the corner of her apartment or leave the shades drawn all day. The green thumb skipped a couple of generations, her father said. Her grandfather had cultivated a bountiful harvest year after year when she was a kid. An urban farm filled the backyard of her grandparents' corner lot duplex. They had once lived on a ranch, but now they were reduced to a 4,000 square foot lot. As a kid, she didn't understand the point of a backyard without grass and play structures. Her grandfather's yard only had a rusty old rocking horse for her and her brother Joe. Everything else was off limits. Sometimes she watched her grandfather putter around, watering the peach, orange, lime, and avocado trees. She kept her distance for fear she'd hear his exasperation. Mija, you're in the way, he'd say without looking at her if she crept too close. Get back to the house. He grew lots of vegetables they could find in the grocery store, but he grew other varietals that were still exotic back then. Tomatillos, nopales, jicama, four different kinds of chiles. He used the row crop method, alternating between mounds of dirt and moats for watering with six distinct patches. 
Green herbs spilled over the sides of planters near the house, cilantro, cumin, oregano, marjoram, and sage. He used them fresh in a chicken soup he made all winter long and tied bunches up and tacked them across the wooden beams in his garage to dry. Teresa's grandmother used a stone, pestle, and mortar to crush the herbs into powder. Teresa's dad took them over on the days her mother worked weekends at a local store. Her grandma combed her long brown hair and yanked at the pangles. Her grandma's wrinkled hands pulled the ponytail holders with the bright red beads at the ends tightly around Teresa's thin hair. Your hair is so stringy, her grandmother said, como tu madre. Her dad had thick, lush black hair that curled around the nape of his neck. Her grandma had short white hair, but in the picture on the living room wall of her as a young woman, her hair is curled into dark victory rolls in the front and it cascaded down her back. Joe had the dark, thick hair and black eyes of their paternity, but she'd gotten what everyone else teased her were white people, brown eyes. Her eyes were flecked with green and gold, her hair light and fine like her mother's. The three adults spoke Spanish when they didn't want the children to know what they were saying, a conspiratorial language that left her and Joe out. Most of the time, her grandfather was quiet. If he wasn't outside in his garden, he sat in the recliner in the corner of the room closest to the front door, a spittoon on the floor next to him. He, spoke, he smoked cigars and spit into the bucket as he watched bowling or golf or his favorite soap opera, Santa Barbara. She and Joe spent most of the time in the kitchen at an oval formica top table with the, floor, the floral pattern peeling off in one corner. Dish towels and empty food containers covered one end of the table because her grandparents reused everything they could around the house. Her grandma filled their bellies with chicken soup or made cheese quesadillas. Teresa especially liked when her grandma made flour tortillas from scratch. The toasty smell filled the room as the dough cooked on a flat pan. Sometimes her grandma rubbed warm flat bread with a cold stick of butter and sprinkled a little sugar and cinnamon on them. Joel rolled them up and called it dulce burrito. Her favorite treat was the peaches her grandma canned each season from the stone fruit her grandfather harvested. When she closes her eyes now, she can almost smell the sweet cinnamon syrup that poured out of the jar into a bowl with each slice. The flavor was lost when her grandmother passed away, and the garden was lost six months later when her grandfather died, too. Teresa's husband, Jared, was the one who wanted to start the garden nine months ago when they moved into the new house. The yard of their new construction home was a barren wasteland of clay and discarded construction artifacts, bits of cement, nails, and screws when they moved in. You can do what you want with the yard, Teresa said. I'm no gardener, though, so don't expect me to help. He bought seeds at the hardware store, filled a used egg carton with dirt. He put a drip tray on the dresser in their bedroom in April where sunlight filtered in most of the day. The first batch of seeds included a few kinds of tomatoes, basil, dill, mesclun, and spinach. Jared didn't know any more about gardening than she did, but he devoted hours to watching YouTube videos. The first batch of seeds went into the ground in a row crop with a soil mix labeled as garden amend. Nothing died, but nothing grew. The plants seemed to be stuck in stasis. Jared wasn't deterred. I just need to build a raised bed and get a richer soil mix, he said. While he worked on designing beds out of three by six fence boards, Teresa found herself caring for a new batch of seedlings. This time, she found herself checking impatiently a few times a day for new growth. On the fifth day after planting, she saw the soil mix breaking apart before, and by the end of the day, a tomato shoot had broken through. Everything sprouted within two weeks, and she watched closely for signs of the first set of true leaves, a term she learned from her husband's garden video obsession. When the plants were six weeks old, she brought them outside to acclimate to the temperature fluctuations, the wind, and the grabby hands of a two-and-a-half-year-old. Be gentle with the baby plants, she told her son. They're very small and delicate. A week after transplanting tomatoes and basil, she walked to the side of the house to fill up a watering can. When she came back around the corner, her son had a toy shovel and had dislodged a cherry tomato plant. No, Elliot, she yelled. That's not for you. You're hurting the plants. He turned toward her, his dark eyes that looked like her father's cast downward on the ground. His lip pouted out over the dimple in his chin, just the way hers does when she's upset. She remembered the exasperation in her grandfather's voice that had kept her at bay. She moved closer and knelt down next to Elliot. Sorry, baby, she said in a gentler voice. Help mommy put the baby plant back. We need to be gentle 
They need dirt around them to get food. You're such a good helper in the garden. The plants in the raised bed flourished. The tomato stood taller than her six-foot husband in mid-September when the green tomatoes finally turned red. Her husband started working on three more garden beds for winter crops. The landscape of their backyard transformed over the summer with life all around. Life is all around. Songbirds filled the yard with a melody in the morning. A squirrel visited at lunch and wreaked havoc on a bed of greens. White moss landed on her broccoli seedlings and laid eggs. Elliot squealed with delight when he found a green caterpillar on one. She placed it on his hand and he giggled as it crawled across her fingers. She took a picture. The broccoli leaves were pitted with holes and it didn't survive. These bugs are horrible, she complained to her husband. It's all a sign that our yard is more hospitable, he responded. It's good, and Elliot loves it. In the corner of the yard, the green leaves have fallen off the cherry tree. Jared and Elliot planted as a Mother's Day gift. Her husband spent four hot days digging a four-by-four hole for the tree. Elliot went out with his toy shovel on the last day. Plant a tree, Mama, he called from across the yard. Cherry tree. It'll be years before they have fruit but they aren't just planting a tree. They're planting a family tradition, carrying on a legacy. Thank you. This is The Jar by Julian Parayano Stoll. I don't remember when dad decided to do it, one day, he took the jar of Skippy's smooth peanut butter from above the fridge. He grunted as he screwed off the sky blue cap. He ripped off the label with a knife. Then, with water scalding and soapy, he washed it inside and out using an old toothbrush. He washed it until the oily brown was all scrubbed from his fingers until the jar smelled like nothing and none of the sticky glue was left in patches on its side. That's okay, I thought. I like crunchy peanut butter more anyway. After drying, he stuck one golden handful after another into the jar until it was half full of bullets. He put it in the living room cabinet next to a messy pile of bills and mom's unchecked lotto tickets. I could see it through the shelf's glass doors. My mom had brought a lot of furniture with her from the Philippines, and by then, this cabinet was the only thing she had left. Its carefully carved wooden dragons, she liked to remind me, are like something my grandfather's crooked hands could have made. The jar stood in front of a photo of us, my brother and sister and mom and I all buried in its shine, leaving only a single balding head peeking out. On the shelf above it, dad hid his work vest, the one he used in the jails that was stab proof, but could be shot through, the one he didn't know I had seen. Sometimes, when the light would catch the jar, I'd stare at it while sitting in the dusty blue Lazy Boy. I would guess how many were in there, like the jar of jelly beans at the public library when I was eight. Look, Dad said, let's count how many there are in a line from top to bottom. Then let's count all the ones at the bottom. That should give us a good idea of how many are in there. It'll take too long, Dad. No, it won't, I promise. Look, one, two, three. I'm just gonna guess a thousand. It looks like a thousand. I scribbled down my answer in blocky kid letters on the slip of pink paper. Needless to say, I didn't win. Once after finishing a chapter of 1984 in The Lazy Boy, I took the heavy jar down and placed one in my palm. It felt smoother than expected for something meant to kill. Heavier, too. I wondered if it would burst when hit by a hammer, if the sparks would be as beautiful as it is now, small and shiny and unopened, 
like wrapped chocolate. After school one hot spring day, I saw dad gritting his teeth in the parking lot. Sweat trickled down his temples in salty rivers. He was too large for the Elantra seat, so as he drove, his head bumped into a brown hole in the fabric above him. All the way, he hunched over the steering wheel with white knuckles wrapped tightly around its fall leather rim. My parents had a fight. In the driveway, dad breathed out heavily and the car rocking back came to a stop. That's when he turned away from me and said quietly, as if I wasn't there. Sometimes I just want to put a bullet in her head. So I just sat there thinking about that jar, about how I'd never know if just one went missing. Thank you. Our next piece is read by Gaz Jamil, titled Self-Portrait by Selma Tufail. Mummy and I always paint in the same corner of the courtyard in Pakistan, right next to the kitchen. This way we can wash up without making a mess. Soak the paper in the sink for a few minutes and hold it carefully when you bring it back, she says. Paper tears easily when it's wet. I like clear instructions. Moments later, I walk back from the kitchen, leaving a trail of little puddles behind me. The sun will dry it up, Mummy reassures me, and takes the paper from my hands. We tape the soggy paper to a board. I load a massive brush with red paint and wipe the bottom of the page. The deep pigment starts creeping up all on its own. Then I paint the middle of the page with orange. Finally, on top of the page, I apply a watery yellow. The colors run all over the page, flowing into each other. I can't stop them. What did I do wrong? I look at mummy. My eight-year-old heart is pounding and my face feels hot. But it's not from the white heat of the afternoon sun. That's how it should be, mummy reassures me. Now we'll leave it to dry. She goes into the kitchen and comes out holding a large purple onion. Look at this, she says. This is the shape of the main dome and the top of the minarets. I practice drawing this on a separate sheet of paper while I wait for the red, orange, and yellow wash to dry. Then I draw the outlines of domes and minarets and add a few palm trees and birds. Now all that's left is to fill the shapes in solid black paint. Painting inside the lines is easy. The final result, a silhouette of a mosque with two minarets, three palm trees, and a dozen or so V-shaped birds flying into a sunset. I look at it with a shy but satisfied smile. In the coming months, I will make many versions of this piece because it never fails to impress. A few months later, war breaks out in Pakistan, so we all move to London, the city where my mother was born, where she lived with her family before she moved with my father to Pakistan. I paint another interpretation of a mosque at sunset for my class teacher, Miss Newbold. I don't tell her that mummy showed me how to make this when we were still in Pakistan and that I've made it many times before. She loves it, and gives me a gold star. The enormous arched windows of my new school, Mortlake Church of England Primary School, are meant to let sunlight in. More often than not, all we see through the glass is a thick gray fog or a light drizzle. But I don't really mind this dreary weather, because it's always bright and warm inside. Beneath the windows next to the teacher's desk is a star chart sprinkled with gold, silver, and bronze stars. Rewards for effort put into our schoolwork. The more gold stars I get, the more likely my house team is to win the end of year prize. Miss Newbold gave me a gold star for my mosque painting, but nothing for the two drawings I made after that. Take your sketchbooks and look for something to draw in the playground, she had said. It was cold outside, so we all trooped into the cloakroom to put on our coats. Excited chatter filled the corridor as we filed out. Everyone found something to draw almost immediately. Holly bushes, red berries, 
daffodils, and some lucky ones found ladybirds. I was the only one still wandering around undecided. And then I found it, my subject. My drawing was as perfect as a photo. I thought it deserved a gold star, but I would have been happy with a bronze one too. Maybe if I'd explained how precise the placement of every single brick was in my drawing of the red brick wall of the dining hall, Miss Newbold might have reconsidered. But I didn't, so she gave me nothing. My other drawing, a self-portrait, doesn't have a star either. But I'm not surprised. That one shouldn't even be on display. I look up at me stuck on the wall with all the other self-portraits. The black and brown crayons I use for my short wavy hair and my dark round eyes are perfect. I like how I drew my small nose and smiling mouth. That was easy. The challenge, though, was the color of my skin. One of the many crayons in the box is the skin color. But whose skin? Certainly not mine. It is a light pinkish peach, the color of cheap plastic dolls they sell back in Pakistan. I pick up an ochre crayon and lightly fill in the area of my face. I look yellow, so I pick up the brown and color over the ochre. Now I look like burnt toast. The teacher stands behind me watching. She leans over and passes me the skin-colored crayon. I use it. This third layer of skin makes my face look like a muddy puddle. I swallow hard to keep from crying. May I go to the toilet, I ask quietly. The teacher nods. And I get up and leave. Hi, my name is Jada Roper, and I'm going to be reading Immigrant by April Halpern Wayland. It's timing. Do I take this dress? Is it just a rag? Should I trim this train when we finally ran, when we caught the train, when the giant came, when the rain rolled in? It's about your aim. Got a stretch to ring when the bell's too far. Reaching out your arm. Never show your fear. That mat by the stair, it will be your mat. Says so on the tag, oh, that's just a rat. Hurry, do not drag. Come on, give a grin. Don't you see your flag? Rest. We're finally in. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. My name is Tanya Udishu, and I am going to be reading my own poem, Eggs. Eggs are delicious. Eggs contain nutrients. Eggs have good fat, protein, and vitamins. Eggs uh, scare me sometimes. Since September 11th, it's hard to like eggs without thinking about how different I am as an Iranian Assyrian. It was a group of white kids. I knew them from high school. They were the jocks from respectable families. They were popular and perfectly white. They were the ideal sons meant to conquer the world. It was 2 a.m. There was no wind. The stillness outside comforted me as I slept in my bed. Then, eggs. I heard four eggs. They were throwing them. They aimed at our door. The crunching impact scared the hell out of me. My dad got out of bed and opened the front door. I saw the kids who did it. I knew who they were. My dad chased them. I could hear Assyrian curse words. I didn't realize how fast my dad could run. The next day, I returned to school. I was ashamed. I wished I was dead. I wished I was invisible. I wished I was white. Thank you. How He Made It Across by Patty Somlo The tenth time the agent asked Alejandro how he made it across, Alejandro gave him the same short, weary answer. Sir, I walked. Alejandro was not too tall, with already dark skin browned further by the sun. His straight black hair looked as if it had been cut with a bowl. He did not raise his head when he spoke. The agent stood next to Alejandro's chair, his right calf brushing the metal leg. He marched over to the desk and back, his steps heavy due to his substantial weight. If Alejandro stood up, the agent would have towered over him by at least a foot. The agent's hair was cut military style, and a pair of sunglasses hung like a weapon from his front uniform pocket. The agent leaned down, his face a few inches from Alejandro's forehead. Alejandro breathed in the acrid aroma of old coffee spilling from the agent's breath. How did you make it across? The agent paused after assaulting Alejandro with each word in slow motion for the eleventh time. Alejandro hadn't eaten for over twenty-four hours. His head ached and his stomach had grown sour. His mother had taught him to always tell the truth, but the truth didn't appear to be what the agent wanted. I walked across, sir, Alejandro repeated for the eleventh time. If the agent had known the entire truth, he would have needed to step outside, spit violently into the street, then stomp to the corner, yank open the heavy wooden door leading into Jake's bar, barely allowing his eyes to adjust before blindly making his way over to the bar and demanding a double Jack Daniels on the rocks. What the agent didn't know was that Alejandro Murguia Lopez had left his village in the south of Mexico, close to the Guatemalan border, on a Monday, before the sun had come up. Tepetapa was a mere sigh in the dusty road from Mexico City to Tegucigalpa, a town barely suggested by a tired tienda with an oft-broken-down generator that kept lemon-lime and sweet orange refrescos cold. Yet on a morning that was still cool and dark, Alejandro felt as if he were leaving more than a shrug of earth behind. He understood that he was also abandoning his life. 
The distance was unfathomable. Being a simple man who believed in God, the Virgin Mary, and the spirits of the corn, rain, moon, and sun, Alejandro hadn't bothered to discover how far America was from Tepetapa. Funny thing, Alejandro didn't know what America looked like, so how would he know once he arrived? He carried a few cold tortillas, a cup full of beans, and another of rice, and a jar filled with water. On his feet, he wore a pair of Nike knockoffs a distant cousin had brought back from Tijuana. By the fourth day of walking, Alejandro had lost track of time. He walked in the daylight and continued to walk at night. When he couldn't walk any more, he lay down to rest in doorways and under bridges and once in an abandoned car. The agent's head hurt, from his temples to a spot in the back above his neck. This job is getting to me. That's what he said to his girl, Maria, at the bar last night, every time she begged him to dance. He'd planned to stick to Coors, since he needed to get up for work at five. But all the damn beer did was fill him up. That's why he started in on dark, sweet, 100-proof rum. They'd finished the new fence and couldn't understand how these cockroaches were still getting across. Computers, cameras, night vision equipment, and stuff the agent was still learning to operate were designed to alert the agents if anyone tried to cut a hole. The cameras were set to take a photograph and trip an alarm the second an illegal tried to get across. So, how did the fucker do it? The agent sure wanted to know. His head was pounding something awful. He'd already taken enough painkillers to put a man out. You walked? The agent said, his right hand clutching the back of the chair where the little Mexican sat. Yes, sir, Alejandro whispered. What did you say? I walked, sir, Alejandro replied more loudly now. Alejandro had grown dizzy as the last day wore on. Luckily, he was still headed in the right direction. The poor man wouldn't have known if he'd gotten turned around. He had dreamed of coming to America for even longer than he could remember. His desire to reach the place had become the engine moving him forward as the power in his legs was wearing out. What I'm trying to figure out is how do you get past the fence? The agent had pulled a wooden toothpick from his pocket and began to use it to clean the spaces between his top front teeth. I don't understand. Alejandro said, ashamed that his English was so poor. La Frontera, the agent shouted, the Spanish words carrying the twang of South Texas. Como te vas atrás? The agent mumbled under his breath without waiting for Alejandro's response. How the fuck did you do it? Alejandro shuffled his feet and tried to calm the beating of his heart. He saw himself sitting on his porch, back in Tepetapa. What he couldn't explain was how a man feels right before the sun comes up, when the silence of the long black night suddenly gets broken by the rooster's morning call. Alejandro couldn't have described the way his spirit grew large and lifted him up, watching the fiery orange ball stretch up into the sky streaked with shredded pink clouds. He had a good idea that the agent wouldn't understand that as the sun climbed, lighting up the fields, Alejandro began to believe he could do anything he wanted. Did you pay a coyote? Did someone help you cross? The agent asked now. Alejandro slowly shook his head from side to side. He couldn't explain that the man sitting in this chair was not the one who left the Petapa over a month before. That man, he was ashamed to admit, had collapsed onto the ground, 
before he had had a chance to try and make it across. At the moment when he hit the dirt, he was on the Mexican side, so close to America it would have taken only a few steps north to get across. His body dropped, and the dust rose all around. For some reason, the wind suddenly picked up. The wind is to blame, Alejandro wanted to say. Instead, he swallowed his words just as they began to form in his mouth. The agent walked heavily across the linoleum floor and out the door. Moving from the chilled air inside, the agent felt as if he'd been slapped with a hot, dry towel. He looked down the road, where the air wavered above the pavement. A cold beer would taste awfully good right now, he thought. Dust buried the tips of his boots a few minutes after he started to walk. He knew it was against patrol procedures to leave an alien alone in the office uncuffed. If the truth be told, the agent hoped Alejandro would take off. He understood that the Mexican wasn't about to tell him how he made it across. He'd let the little guy vanish and both of them would be off the hook. By the time the agent returned to the office, after nursing one cold Coors Light, Alejandro was heading toward San Diego. He had gone past the point of hunger. He understood that on the Mexican side of the border, something otherworldly had taken place. The man he had been was turned into dust after his last breath released itself and his heart made one final clap. The dust of Alejandro Murguia Lopez, a poor farmer from Tepetapa, lifted into the wind above the border and drifted across. As it cleared the fence meant to keep Mexicans like Alejandro out, the dust didn't even bother to hide. Alejandro entered the city of San Diego at dusk. It took him no time to blend in with the other men from villages where light at night came from the stars. Months after, he found himself on a warm, clear evening, looking up at the sky. He imagined that the poor farmer from Tepetapa was hanging suspended there, wondering whether coming to America had been worth giving up his life. At that moment, the quiet man assured his old self that he was glad he had made it to the other side. Though life wasn't easy, as the poor farmer had so often fantasized, this American guy, Al Lopez, was doing all right. Julia, you're muted. Let's start your session over. Ha! Huh? Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd provide some, uh, that was a little, little humor for the evening. Sorry about that, y'all. I will be starting over. This is Julia Halpern Jackson reading Rescuing Esther by Lyra Halpern. For real this time. I've bought many raffle tickets over the years from kids raising money for schools and sports and organizations seeking cures for diseases. But I've never bought a raffle ticket that would save someone from a gas chamber. I never contemplated such a thing until my mother told me that her mother organized one. Jesus. Grandma Ann organized that raffle to help bring her youngest sibling, Esther, and Esther's son to the US in the 1930s. They came from Lvov, an historic walled city in Galicia, an area that changed nationalities depending on which country was in power in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I can imagine my grandmother hearing the frightening news leaking out of Europe, ignored by the US government, about Nazis revving up their killing machine. In addition to the literal pennies Grandma Ann managed to save from the grocery money, 
her peddler husband Julius gave her for food. She hoped the raffle, maybe for a handmade dress or delicious baked goods, would raise enough money to bring her sister and nephew to America. I have visions of my preteen mother in her Cleveland neighborhood, knocking on doors, standing back, hoping no one was home. Oh, I so didn't want to ask neighbors for money and explain why, mom said. I didn't even know the relatives we were bringing over. I hated that raffle. The only other relative on my grandmother's side who survived World War II was a niece who fled to England where she married a German Jew. Together they immigrated to Israel. I can't believe my grandparents were oblivious to what was happening to Jews in Austria and Poland. In my grandmother's hometown of Lvov, the Jewish population depended on who controlled the city. Pogroms in 1917 and 1918 killed or injured hundreds of Jews and burned and looted homes. Later, the Nazis smashed the once thriving city, which was taken over by the Soviets in 1939. Lvov was once home to 200,000 Jews. Today, there are fewer than 5,000. However pragmatic my, grand my grandparents may have been, each of the nine children I knew, my mother and her siblings, was a thoughtful progressive. Even my uncle Davy, who broke his nose in golden gloves boxing and was kicked out of college. Raphael was blacklisted and prevented from practicing law because he refused to take a loyalty oath during the McCarthy era. Chuck, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel was a vocal environmentalist who ran for Lieutenant Governor of Alaska. My pianist mother played many benefit concerts for progressive causes. Unlike the black and brown communities of our country who experience racism and bigotry on a daily basis, many American Jews have white skin that protects us. But it's still surprising to me when people scrutinize Jewish sounding last names or Semitic facial features People still occasionally say to me, you don't look Jewish, which feels both like a backhanded compliment and a warning. By the time I was in junior high school, I understood that hard work or money won't protect anyone all the time. Most American Jews my age experience some anti-Semitism from red line neighborhoods where we, like blacks, Latinos, and Asians weren't welcome to the invisible social ostracism of country clubs that wouldn't let us swim, play golf, or eat. My own children were denied play dates at a school friend's house because we weren't Christian. When I worked at the beach club in Santa Monica, the manager looked me in the eye and proudly announced that they had no Jewish members. She didn't know her staff very well. In addition to fear about what might happen after the Auschwitz ovens cooled, these incidents fueled my desire to help others who have been made to feel that they don't belong. When we heard about children being imprisoned in cages along the US-Mexico border, my friends and I protested it in front of our county courthouse and on the lawn of California's state capitol. My anger at the January 2017 Trump administration's sudden revocation of visas for Muslims intensified my activism. The night the visa doors suddenly slammed shut, I grabbed red and blue marker pens and wrote, refugees welcome here on one side of a square cardboard and no wall on the other. I drove to Sacramento International Airport to greet the Delta Airlines 11.40 p.m. flight from Mexico City. Alone, I stood where family and friends are allowed to wait. I clutched my sign unsure if I wanted to show or hide the words, confused about what I was doing there, but unwilling to leave. The Mexico jet landed and a steady stream of tired travelers walked past me, some wearing Western hats and silver belt buckles, many carrying tired children. I held up my sign, embarrassed but compelled to tell these people that I too was an American and I wanted them here. After most of the passengers were on the down escalator to the baggage carousels, a dark haired young woman came up to me and hesitantly said, I was so happy to see your sign. Thank you. I smiled as relieved as she appeared to be. 
No more passengers were disembarking. We stood there looking at each other, a message passing between us. Who helped you get here? And I wondered, did they have a raffle? Thank you. Hello. Um, the next story is migration to immigration or uh, to immigrate or not to immigrate. That is the question by Benjamin Duarte. I am an, am, I am an immigrant, sort of, I say to myself. And please know right at the start that I did not face the hardships of most modern day immigrants. I was born in Esqueda, Sonora, Mexico, and I lived as a Mexican citizen until I was 10 years old when my Texas born mother registered me as a citizen of the US born abroad. I was asked by the consular officer in Douglas, Arizona, if I was now renouncing my Mexican citizenship. I said, yes. I was fully insulated in the Mexican culture language, customs, history, folklore. Yet, I was also familiar with some aspects of life in the United States. My mother was raised in Bisbee, Arizona, where my grandma lived until her death in 1946. Thus, I was exposed to this part of the United States when, between the ages of four and six, I visited grandma several times. Moreover, while we were living in Mexico, mother would give me rudimentary English reading lessons from an old mother goose book. She also supplemented the U.S. history I learned in Mexican school by telling me about the founding fathers, especially her favorite, Benjamin Franklin. So how did I get to be a 10-year-old renouncing Mexican citizenship in Douglas, Arizona? Just the fates having fun. During her senior year at Bisbee High, mom gave in to her romantic self and took off to Mexico with a smooth talker 21 years her senior, my dad. He was a Mexican national working at the local copper mine. A couple years later, they settled in Esqueda, a little village about 45 miles south of the U.S. border, and started a family. Life got tough in Esqueda. My father left us when I was four years old, and some months later, my older brother, who at 16 had become our main breadwinner, had to leave town under stressful circumstances. Mom did her best to provide for us, but there were no jobs for her. We could barely afford to eat one meal per day, even with grandma's help, the used clothing and two or three dollars that she sent monthly from Bisbee. Soon, my mother started traveling to the U.S. for short work stays to earn money for our support. She would leave me, the youngest, in Bisbee with grandma and go on to Phoenix to work as a waitress cook at a restaurant owned by a high school friend. I remember grandma sending me, a not yet five-year-old child, to the little grocery store a couple of blocks away along a road called Brewery Gulch. I put the couple of items on the counter and handed the lady the ration stamps. World War II was in progress, I later learned, along with my money. This was different for me. Foodstuffs were openly displayed on shelves. You could touch and select the items and take them to the counter where you paid. In Esqueda, all the foodstuffs were behind the counter where the store owner or member of his family stood. You told him or her what you wanted and it was given to you e.g. 10 centavos worth of lard slapped into a cone-shaped piece of butcher paper. And at grandma's, the toilet was inside the house, a bathroom instead of an outhouse. The water tank was overhead and you flushed by pulling a chain with a little wooden bell-shaped knob at the end. Water flushed the waste away from that impossibly white bowl and you were not subject to a permanent malodorous ambiance. Better living conditions and yet... I looked forward to returning to the village where my siblings and humble dwelling waited, where I felt I belonged. Stuck in a meager existence, we could only foresee a meager future. Food was scarce. We were now living with a woman who had three children of her own and eked out a living by doing laundry for the wealthier people in the village. Most of the folks in Esqueda were poor, but they were also kind-hearted. In 1946, with my grandmother's help no longer available, conditions forced my mother's hand and we moved north to the border town of Agua Prieta, now called AP by the hip, rich Mexicans there. I was enrolled in school and my mother got a job in a maternity dress factory in Douglas, Arizona. Our living conditions had improved. Mom walked the distance from our place in Agua Prieta to and from her work about 14 miles total. 
The customs officer soon got used to her daily crossing. Seated on his stool by the walkway, he would say a friendly, good morning, and she walked by and said, U.S. citizen. By early 1950, my siblings had left mom's side and authority. The convenience of earning dollars and spending pesos, almost two pesos per dollar, no longer seemed to outweigh the freezing winter and sizzling summer walks to and from work. Our living quarters consisted of two small rooms with no indoor plumbing or kitchen facilities, no electricity. We had a kerosene heater for winter, gets down to nine degrees Fahrenheit in that part of the Sonora Desert, and counted ourselves lucky that the outhouse, a solid shack with a two-hole seat, was right outside our apartment. My mom, a good worker, wanted to be closer to her workplace, mainly though she wanted to be somewhere where I would have a chance at a good future. So she decided to repatriate herself. She registered me as a U.S. citizen, and we moved to Douglas, Arizona. Even for a 10-year-old, there were opportunities here not to be found south of the border. I started selling the Douglas Dispatch, five cents for the latest news. Then I became a shoeshine boy. I could go into regular bars as well as the Tony one in the Gadsden Hotel. Shoeshine boy paid better than newsboy, and I helped with the household expenses. When I enrolled in school, a very nice lady teacher walked me from the kindergarten room to which I'd been assigned to the other classrooms to determine my grade placement. A reading of the classroom text, one or two pages, and on to the next grade we would go. By noon, I'd been promoted to fourth grade. No bilingual teachers then, just good Anglo humans doing right. The teachers in the U.S. were as capable and dedicated as the ones in Mexico. So what was different that impressed me? There was something very orderly about this new country to which I now belonged. The paved streets, the marked parking spaces, the fact that motorists obeyed the traffic lights and signs, all these things were remarkable to me in a positive way. I had my teeth cleaned for the first time in my life. Ouch. Also remarkable, but in a strange way, was that the only people who made fun of whatever accent I had, I was still learning to speak English, were those of Mexican origin. Also, this same group was averse to the word Mexican. Query, are you Mexican? Answer, no, I'm Spanish. I was mildly amused and puzzled. The kids wouldn't speak Spanish. They seemed embarrassed by their ancestry. When I was 10, I used to ask myself, don't they know about the Aztec civilization? Even in high school in California, most of my ethnic peers displayed this reserve. I am glad Cesar Chavez came along. Now, being acculturated into our society and supposedly an educated person, I know we need improvement in our beloved U.S. of A. And I nourish my hopes for progress by remembering the stories of others who have come to our country to find opportunities for a better future. Over a couple of beers in a Willow Glen bar, my friend Julio related how he had come from Jalisco when he was 15 years old in a bus with a group of women going to Tijuana to work as prostitutes. He told me how they had adopted him and helped him along. By the time I met him, he had his own landscaping business in the Santa Clara Valley and was in the 70s, paying his undocumented employees $18 per hour. His parents and siblings were still in Mexico. He had bought them the land on which they lived and grew crops. He loved and praised this country as most who came here looking for a better life do. Yes, immigration is not a new thing. Think of those shaggy-looking humans crossing the frozen Bering Strait and venturing out onto the American continent. I first heard about this from my high school history teacher. He made the point that human migration is basically an escape from combined with a search for. He was of Irish descent and told us if it weren't for the potato famine of 1840, I wouldn't be standing here teaching you today. Anthropology reveals fact. There are no Native Americans, that's just a term of convenience. Original Americans fits the facts. Also, the convergence of truth and logic yields this. Anyone born on the American continent is a Native American. Thank you. I will be reading Immigrant Dreams by Marianne Schoen. Last night, I had a dream. I was in Korea. I was walking down a busy street to meet someone. 
It was summertime and the air was thick and heavy. I was in a hurry and trying to walk quickly, as quickly as someone can walk in a dream. Thinking back to that dream, there was nothing about my surroundings that was like anything I remember about Korea. Nothing that I can pinpoint, no special landmark that indicated I was in Korea. I just knew. I occasionally have dreams like this. I'm either speaking to someone in Korean, or I'm sleeping on the floor of my grandmother's house, or I'm eating thukboki, spicy rice cakes, at a street vendor's stand, or I just know it. It's funny to me that I would dream of a place I have no actual memories. My family immigrated to the United States when I was 18 months old. The day we left, I was with my mother and father, my twin sister, and my cousins, who were nine and five years old. My cousin's father had left them a year prior, and my mother, my aunt, was waiting for them in the US. Of course, I was too young to have a memory of that day, but for some reason I do. The memory is foggy and jumbled like a dream. The way we are standing in a busy area of Gimpo Airport, it's humid and hazy inside. The air is thick and heavy. My nine-year-old cousin is carrying my sister on his back using a Korean-style baby wrap. At nine years old, he has already given the responsibility of a much older child. My mother is carrying me and holding the hand of my five-year-old cousin while my father is managing our luggage, boxes wrapped in large pieces of cloth. I've never even seen a photo of that day. This pseudo-memory was conjured from the stories that my family occasionally shares with one another. It's as if my mind, needing a mental image of my origin story, decided to dream up this memory on its own. Perhaps this is why immigrants are also called dreamers. My mother grew up along the coast in Masan, a small village that neighbors the larger city of Busan. When she was a young girl, she used to run out to the beach to pick off fresh mussels and sea squirt from the rocks and carry them back home for dinner. I don't know when I first heard this story. I just see myself running along the beaches of Masan in search of fresh seafood. I can smell the briny ocean breeze blowing through my wild curly hair. I once heard someone say that all immigrants are artists because they create something out of nothing. They create a new life for themselves out of deficit, hunger, need, and lack. It takes a great deal of creativity to imagine a new life that's full of hope and promise while also pushing past a broken past. My parents left Korea for a better life and a better home. They had grown up in squalor during the aftermath of the Korean War. After 1965, the U.S. loosened immigration laws seeing a need for skilled labor. Koreans, wanting to leave a war-torn country with high unemployment and little chance to get ahead, took advantage of this. It was mutually beneficial to both parties. An unspoken agreement, if you will. Come to our country with your skills and expertise to build our economy, and we will provide you a home. But you will never belong here. My mom was considered a skilled laborer, a nurse. My dad had studied law in Korea. His first job in the U.S was at a gas station. We settled in Southern California with some of our extended family following suit. My sister and I were allowed to tag along with my mom to the hospital where she worked, a bag of books, crayons, and paper in tow to keep us busy. Later, my grandmother came to live with us. My grandmother had limited mobility because of a stroke. I have a memory of being at home with my grandmother and hearing the doorbell ring. They were likely kids around my age, going door to door selling Girl Scout cookies or other fundraising goods. We took a while to open the door, and when we did, nobody was there. My grandmother was furious, thinking they had pulled a prank. 
She made me put my shoes on and walk quickly down the street after these kids. When we caught up to them, my grandmother yelled out, telling me to translate her message. She said, never do that again or grandma will give them a spanking. At the time, I was utterly mortified. At the time, I was unable to appreciate this exchange from an old world traditional culture where you did not come to someone's home unannounced and allowed older generations to discipline younger ones, even with no familial ties. This was a memory I had wished I could forget. After the shooting in Atlanta, where six women of Asian descent were gunned down in a targeted hate killing, a colleague of mine who was half Korean shared with me a nightmare she had had. She dreamed that a lone gunman was seeking to hunt down and kill the Korean half of her family. She woke up feeling terrified, trying to process this collective trauma of feeling targeted and betrayed. I remember seeing a photo of one of the Korean women that were killed and thinking that she looked like my cousin. On that day, the dreams of these six beautiful souls were literally shot down. Their stories were not shared, and the only story that seemed to matter was the story of the killer, the lone white gunman. What was he thinking? What was he trying to accomplish? What kind of day had he had? Maybe it's time for me to realize that this idea of belonging in this place where I grew up is not a reality. Maybe it's time for me to stop dreaming and wake up. Thank you. A piece by Sebastián Gómez Vigueri. After school, my sister and I used to watch dubbed 90s sitcoms that networks would buy for cheap to fill up airtime. The TV announced Paso a Paso and Mamá would hum the tune absentmindedly while she made lunch. Full House came after, the big red letters overdub in English but pronounced with a slight Spanish accent. The way houses and streets and people on the shows looked was as foreign as most of the jokes the characters landed with bad lip sync. A crowd would burst into laughter to let us know that that was the punchline, and we wondered how come no one in the show could hear them. It didn't make much sense to us, but we would watch anyway, waiting for the cartoons to start. Cartoons did make sense. A particular memory from my first days or years in this country, was a new, unnerving sensation that circled beneath the stimulus of novelty. For all I knew, the manicured desolation of suburbia belonged to the realm of fiction. It was the strangest feeling to get lost in the seamlessness of silent mansions that looked just like the facades in that alien TV life, with alien TV families and alien TV jokes. As the brain became accustomed to the dull patterns, such uneasiness subdued to the general alienation of being a permanent, where are you from, but never quite entirely. Perhaps under the thin crust of reason, there's a child asking that if this place actually exists, what about all the monsters we learned not to fear when we grew up? Although the sensation does not conform to the shape and weight of a doubt, but to a deep, cautionary vibration, the one that tells you something doesn't add up before you can do the math that this is the spot where saber-tooths hunt. But as the map becomes the territory, the murmur quiets its voice. It's been a hell of time now. I taught myself to you the O's, fizz the thuz, and water down the R's. San Fernando, Los Gatos, San Jose, Love and fear made this place real, like the vaccine scar on my arm. 
Still sometimes, if I'm moving through a quiet square of the map shaded by yellow light, the warning will ring again and my hairs will raise and my fingertips spark right as I turn around the corner, expecting the end of the sprawl and the laugh track. Trabajamos en la casa del diablo grande, que a veces baja de su habitación y se muestra como un capataz bien humorado. Las gruesas paredes de ladrillo se descascaran y exhiben sus tripas detrás del revoque de cal. La luz cálida del interior proyecta el enrejado del caserón colonial sobre el patio queriendo atrapar a los obreros que afuera se mueven atareados. Nuestra cuadrilla de plomeros se encarga de reparar el intricado sistema de cañerías que serpentea a través del edificio. La irregularidad del diseño y las partes convierten la tarea en una cuestión de prueba y error para determinar dónde encaja cada pieza faltante. Mi colega y yo trabajamos en extender una sección a medida que otro equipo avanza haciendo exactamente lo contrario, apilando en el medio del patio las piezas de cañería que instalamos un momento antes. Mientras trabajamos de arriba nos llega el eco de unos acordes torpes de guitarra, de mi guitarra. El diablo grande me la pidió prestada. Mi compañero dice, You shouldn't have shown him your heart, con su acento de diablito de otra parte. Yo le digo que está bien, que después me la va a devolver. Pero yo sé que no. Ayer, el diablo grande bajó y nos charló un rato. Me llamó aparte y me comentó lo satisfecho que estaba con mi desempeño. Me dijo que acá hay mucho trabajo y me ofreció contratarme para siempre. Le agradecí y le dije que lo iba a pensar. Mi compañero dice que es buena seguridad, un trabajo para siempre. Out there, amiguita, out there at the market, show them your worth. What a deal they could score. Show them your hands, your mother's smile. Proud bow, genuflect, and kiss the blue sky goodbye to buy the bread that you made. Crawl to bed or pace or dig a hole for your head. Hear your little friends say, Hermana, I thought you were smart. You shouldn't have shown them your heart. And then whisper before they go, Puff, you have nothing to lose but the war. Life on the moon sprawl wasn't easy. Anyone can tell you. For a start, indoor smoking was frowned upon, and the joint would go out the instant you climbed out the blank landscape. Stores were speckled over the harsh surface, and although at the time you could walk around the whole dumb ball in just a couple hours, now it takes longer. You know, everything gets bigger. Still, they were hard to find. Some were far at the bottom of the crater where you could see their neon signs telling you it was open. They never bothered to turn it off when it wasn't. I remember finding one under a big boulder. We could hear the jackpot ATM machine yelling from down below but never managed to find a way in. Pets would bounce off orbit if they got too excited. Often we would use long sticks to hook back down a folk adrift whose belly wasn't full enough of wine to keep them anchored. That's why you can't find a single tree on the moon. We made sticks out of them to keep things in place. Moon sickness. I never got used to it. The sky was gorgeous, yes indeed. The tar abyss free of billboards. But not easy. Anyone can tell you. Hello. Um, I'm just going to introduce our next piece. That's uh, To a Chinese Mouse by Yun Lushen, as read by Evelyn Wynn.
To a Chinese Mouse Reading Robert Burns in the Year of the Rat Everything was different on January 25th, 2020. That evening, I gathered a group of 12 friends from Illinois, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Texas, Hawaii, China, Estonia, Ecuador, France, Germany, and the Maldives in my one-bedroom apartment just across the river from New York City. At 9 p.m., the solemn melody of Scotland the Brave pierced into the living room as Beth, with a Balmoral bonnet perched on her head, strode in with her bagpipe. Najwa followed, reverently holding a plate with a single dumpling and set it down on the dining table next to the stir-fried rice cakes and roast duck. <laughs> Laughter broke out across the room as Adrian waved a large chef's knife at the quivering dumpling and declared, Fair for your honest sonsy face, great chieftain of the puddin' race. <laughs> we were celebrating Gong Haggis Fat Choy, a mashup of my two favorite holidays, Chinese New Year on the cusp of January, February, and Burns Night on January 25th. Rabbi Burns' birthday. This year, the two holidays fell on the same day, a rare occurrence. Gong Hei Fa Choi is a Cantonese phrase, meaning, may you be prosperous, often repeated during Chinese New Year. Haggis is a Scottish delicacy comprising of sheep offal and oats in a sheep's stomach, always served at Burns Night, an annual event to celebrate the Scottish bard's life and work. The mashup was created by a Vancouver native aptly monikered Toddish McWong. Food, rituals, scotch, and poetry are neatly fused together with dumpling haggis as the central feature. In a way, the mashup echoes my life in North America as a first generation Chinese Canadian. As the host, I would toast the immortal memory of Burns during dinner. He lived a storied life, rising from farmer's son to national treasure, and was popular with the ladies. <laughs> His impact on culture reaches far beyond the Scottish Moors. Old Lang Syne is sung around the world every year at New Year in dozens of languages. While looking for new material for my toast that day, I opened a volume of selected poems, and the pages fell open to To a Mouse. Many of us know the famous lines from that poem. The best laid scheme of mice and men, gang after glay, often goes awry. Perhaps made more familiar to American readers by John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, I never read the poem closely in its entirety. With all the archaic Scottish words, the initial read didn't register much meaning in my head. In true millennial fashion, I decided to Google a video recitation and learned that Burns had accidentally plowed through the nest of a mouse and had written the poem on the same day out of remorse. Suddenly the imagery in the poem came alive. The we timorous beastie had start away say hasty after the unfortunate incident with its wee bit hoosie and ruin all with december's winds and suin burns imagined that the mouse had thought to dwell cozy in its nest but it's is now turned out and must endure winter's sleety dribble the imagery is captivating, but it is the modern day themes that impress me. Man's dominion has broken nature's social union. Written in 1785, Burns would not have realized how true those words would be 235 years later. Man's dominion has turned up many a nest with our cruel cultures of desire and consumption. The last two stanzas floored me with their insight. But Moosey, thou art no thy lane alone, in proving foresight may be in vain. 
The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay, and leas not but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee, but oak, I backward cast my e on prospects drear, and forward though I cannot see, I guess and fear. At this point, it struck me that this is the first day of the year of the rat. My zodiac sign. It suddenly felt like Burns was speaking across the centuries to me. Every 12 years mark a cycle in the Chinese zodiac. In the year of our zodiac sign, occurring at ages of approximate multiples of 12, we are told to expect some turbulence. At the end of my first cycle, I left China with my parents and moved to North America. At the end of the second, I finished grad school and moved to New York City. The last cycle in the city has brought career setbacks, heartaches, and an unexpected stroke, but also tremendous joy and growth. I feel especially fortunate to have the friends who helped me through it all. Life certainly hasn't unfolded the way I expected it to, though the unexpected has brought its own rewards. I saw veiled advice from Burns to only be touched by the present and to not guess and fear. Blissfully ignorant of the turbulence in the year ahead, I uh, read the poem at the dinner on January 25th, complete with a toy mouse that scurries when you tug on the tail. <laughs> People laughed, and uh, several friends identified themselves also as rats. Looking out at this gathering of friends from around the world, I felt a deep connection to humanity across space and time. We danced, we drank Marsala chai, we sang Auld Lang Syne, and then we hugged goodbye. None of us imagined how things would change in the months to follow. We had heard of the virus in China at that time, yes, but no one anticipated the extent to which it would change our lives. How many well-laid schemes would go awry? <laughs> How many people would be turned out, losing their livelihood or lives? No one foresaw the protests, wildfires, and political turmoil that would sweep across the country. As someone who loves to host dinner parties, social distancing for over a year has been a lonely experience. It's also hard to watch the country divided, unable or unwilling to find common ground. The distances that separate us, both physical and ideological, can feel vast. Yet I remain hopeful. Everything was different on January 25th, but at the same time, nothing is different. In January or in December, in 2020 or 1785, we are all fighting for the best version of our lives and we've all experienced cycles of turbulence. The nature of cycles is that things always turn around if we make an effort to create change. Gong Haggis Fat Choi brought together Scottish and Chinese Canadians in Vancouver, two communities with a long history of racial tension. I believe we can find shared values in our humanity and collectively move forward. So let us not guess and fear. Let us do our best in the present. Reach out, extend a helping hand if you can. And in the moments of respite, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for Auld Lang Syne. My name is Christina Son, and this is Minutes by Muesli. 
from an adaptation of Hamlet that exists only in my head. 20 years ago, in the wake of the LA riots, the church gossip was all about proud Kyung So Ka's marriage to a black restaurant owner. Now, the talk is about Kyung So's husband's death in a car accident. But what really happened is far stranger. After years of stigma, rather than bear the final shame of her divorce, Kyun Suk impulsively lied that her husband was dead. No one guesses the truth, except their son, Julian, who was driving home for the funeral when he glimpsed his father at a gas station. Julian was initially convinced of what he saw. However, immersed again in the pressures of his three cultures, Korean, Black, American. Has Julian started to believe his father is really dead and the man he saw was a ghost? I did what Kensuk asked. I called Julian. She already told him about his dad, but it was just my job to accompany him home. It was so selfish. Julian had just lost his dad to a car accident but it hurt to hear the second hand. People used to wonder where Julian was and I used to always have an answer. He's at soccer. He's at Chan's dad's hog one. But things had changed since we went to college. Things naturally do. Hearing this from his mother was strange too. It's not like I knew Julian's parents well. Sure, I was around all the time, but do you ever really know someone's parents? Walking to Julian's for a ride to school, I'd see Kyun Suk outside and bow. Then I'd peek through the door. There, Julian would be at the table with a forgotten plate by his elbow, hungrily absorbing a book. I'd call his name. One more minute, he'd say with a star soft, startled smile. As Julian's dad backed the van out of the driveway, I'd sneak another look at her. Kyun Suk painting in the garden, Kyun Suk hiding behind her easel and her hair, which silvered as the three of us grew, you, me, and Julian. Even as a kid, I knew what the church ajuma said about her. But whenever I finished a drawing I liked, I'd wonder what Kyun Suk would say. I was never brave enough to talk to her. I never had the courage you have, Jian. Anyway, the day came for Julian and I to drive the 14 hours to LA. I didn't know how to tell Julian I was afraid he wouldn't show, but I did tease him for being so late. It was the first thing I said to him, actually. He had studied abroad last spring. I took my turn that autumn, a homestay with an Italian family so kind to me that I felt guilty every time I interacted with them. And over the summer, I did my time in one of those glamorous, thankless internships that gives your mom bragging material at the church. Which meant that when, I, when Julian picked me up that day in December, I hadn't seen him in a year. He was wearing a green hoodie that was too big for him. And he was late. I tried to ignore how unlike him that was. And it worked once I saw him. I was standing under a street lamp. I had the irrational fear that he wouldn't recognize me. I heard the rumble of an engine and found myself turning before I could think. You're three hours late, I said, raising an eyebrow, my anxiety quietly folding in on itself. Julian grinned and ducked his head. I'm three hours late. I folded my arms. I was legally allowed to leave after 15 minutes. It had been a year, seeing again how he'd blink in surprise at his own laughter. The old feeling stole softly back, like a humbled lover asking for forgiveness. Chian, you asked if I was sure I saw Julian's father that night at the gas station. Nobody believes me, but it hurt when I thought even you doubted me. I did see Julian's father, Chian. He drove us to school. He gave you money for a cotton candy ticket at the spring fair. Don't we know his face? You nodded, and I sensed you confirming something privately with yourself. You know, 
Julian mentioned this actually, how he can hear you putting words together in your head. It's something he loves about you. Did you know? In college, talking about ideas and shapes and gestures, it's like tracing circles in the air. But when I talk to you, I feel my words landing somewhere, meeting solid ground. It makes me realize I miss home. Julian and I didn't say much on the drive home. I told myself it was just the kind of silence you and I share. Julian was deep in thought as streetlights floated by, illuminating the curve of his cheek, his eyelashes, his trembling smile, his hand on the wheel keeping us from floating too far out to sea. Then he was hungry. I needed a restroom. We took an exit, red taillights chasing the rush of darkness at the end of the freeway underpass, fast food logos, traffic signs glowing with borrowed luminance, everything clinging to the edge of brightness. We also passed a gas station, a shock of white in the dark. We weren't running on empty, but we were on the verge of nowhere and I convinced him filling up here was safest. Then it happened, Chian. I didn't know how to tell Julian. I thought I, but I didn't have to. He kept driving home. What else could he do? I don't know if you remember, but when I came home for freshman winter break, there's something you said about homesickness. My mom had put out apple slices. We ate as I recounted some silly drama I'd gotten entangled in. You had the grace to laugh when I laughed. You know me, I'd wanted no part, but I'd have a single conversation with someone and they'd shake their life loose. Do you think all college drama comes from homesickness, you had asked? You said it casually, tossing and catching a throw pillow. I watched it land in your hands again. Breaking the silence in Julian's car, I didn't know how to tell Julian what you said. It sounded clumsy in my words, but I read aloud the sign ahead. Los Angeles, 150 miles. Our headlights gleamed off the letters as I suddenly wanted to tell him. An impulse I hadn't felt in years and wondered if that too was homesickness. Even this feels like home. You and I arguing weeks after the funeral you knew I was hiding something Julian told me, and I knew you'd learned something from Kyunsuk, but both of us refused to tell. My parents weren't home. We'd become the parents talking in helpless circles in the kitchen. Then you moved silently to the living room. I cut apples and followed you. Judging from the noises across the street, the next door party goers were filing out. Someone yelled a joke insult, Someone on our TV said something outrageous in answer. And you finally spoke. Are you sure it was Julian's dad that night? Frustration rose, hot the way tears do. I told you I was, and I watched you accept that immediately. We should write for them, I said, conciliatory, gesturing at the soap opera credits. You nodded, considering silently. I can't remember what we watched, but I remember the laugh track. I remember you laughed a few times, even though you kept brushing your hair aside to play with your new earring. You always had the grace to laugh. Your earlobe was swollen. I remember you reached for the remote and turned down the volume. Isn't it weird, you asked, having such a big piece of our childhood gone. I wasn't sure if you meant the father or the son. It's still there. It's just different. I pretended not to notice you licking your fingers. You were talking so slow and serious, but all I saw was a kid in the dark eating apples. Julian's not that good an actor, you said at last. I took a breath. Kyunsuk's not that good a liar. 
There. Now we could stop pretending we hadn't given each other all the pieces, hoping the other would put them together. Relief, too, was hot like tears. You ever think about doing what Julian did, you asked? You could see I didn't understand. I heard your thoughts collecting in silence. Pretending you've lost it, saying anything you want, becoming someone else. No, I said. This always reminded me of middle school, you and me watching TV on the couch. So why did it feel like we were so old? <laughs> no. I said, turning it over in my head. The street chatter had dwindled to two laughing voices exchanging goodbyes. You nudged my foot with your sucked foot with your own. Probably a good thing. Then you glanced backward, then a growing engine and headlights cut to slices by the blinds. You licked your fingers. As my parents come in, we slip to my room and keep talking under the ravaged glow-in-the-dark stars, the ones my dad couldn't peel off. We're talking about this or that, and I don't notice when it happens, but I must have said something hopelessly characteristic. In any case, you laugh, and I can't quite see your face. You haven't changed at all, Hosa. It was good to hear. I didn't know how to tell you. It's dark and my parents' voices are quiet in the next room and I feel I could confess anything. Now we're talking about our memories of Julian, of three friends growing up in the brilliant heat of Los Angeles. Of Julian Ha, the boy who didn't fit anywhere, the boy who wore oversized sweatshirts and blinked at his own laughter. Not the boy who barely knew us and who we barely knew. Not the boy we both. I didn't know how to tell Julian I loved him, but I did tell him I'd drawn him once. It's just a sketch, but he's turning to face the viewer with a soft, startled smile. A portrait's just a portrait. The subject faces you, observing you as you observe them. My drawing, though, was a disturbed moment, a question. And that's what I'm trying to say, Jian. I wonder whether it was like that for Kyunsuk, if this was why she hid behind her easel and her silvering hair. If when you've fallen for the person you were never meant to fall for, love starts to feel like asking a question. Maybe he gets tired of having to be the answer. Maybe you get tired of asking. Before we hit the road, Julian suggested I stay over in his dorm. He forgot something, and it was too late to start driving anyway. After he turned out the lights, I didn't dare reach across the darkness with my voice. As I fell asleep in his futon, curled up so I could fit, I thought about the birthday sleepovers his dad hosted. Remember those? I never wanted them to end. Anyway, he made breakfast before we set out. We sat on the kitchen at counter like kids eating off paper plates. Someone left the student newspaper behind. Julian's voice shook with laughter as he read me a headline. That morning, I noticed how his hands were gentle with everything he touched. From the oranges he squeezed for our breakfast to the newspaper he folded. And when he finished with it, those hands were gentle, even with the things they used, put away, destroyed. He glanced at me sideways, grinning, but I had lost my smile. I took my plate out of my hands and he didn't get up to throw it away. Los Angeles, he asked, leaning into me. I lean back. One more minute. I didn't know how to tell Julian I love him, but I did tell him. Thank you.
Kageyama, and I am nine years old. I have naturally curly hair. I love to sing and dance, and I like to skateboard at the skate park. I have mixed Korean and Japanese heritage. My mom immigrated to the U.S. when she was little. My dad is a third generation Japanese American and a native Coloradan. At home, I speak Korean when I'm practicing Taekwondo or singing a BTS song. I use hachi, that's Japanese for chopsticks when eating sushi or ramen noodles. These are all things that make me unique. Last year in 2020, a deadly coronavirus spread rapidly all over the world. It was a global pandemic. Many people blame China because the virus started in China. Many people also blame Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. I don't understand why. We didn't start the virus. During World War II, something similar happened to Japanese Americans, including many of my family. The U.S. was at war with Japan, Germany, and Italy. People were afraid that Japanese Americans were spies for Japan, even though Japanese Americans lived their whole life in the U.S. and they are American citizens. It was called the Executive Order 9066. Tens of thousands of Japanese Americans were taken from their homes and forced to live in internment camps. They lived in poorly insulated and unsanitary stables and barracks. The camps were surrounded with barbed wire fencing and guarded with guns. The Japanese American prisoners were prisoners in their own country. We know that this was racist because German Americans and Italian Americans were not forced into internment camps, even though the U.S. was also fighting Germany and Italy. My great aunt, Antioche, was sent to an internment camp with her family when she was 12 years old. Her family lived in San Jose, California, but they were sent to live in Boston, Arizona. There were internment camps all over the U.S. in Manzanar, in Manzanar, California, Park Mountain, Wyoming, even right here in Colorado. Some Japanese Americans, men, fall, volunteered to fight in the U.S. military hoping that their family members would be released from these camps to prove their loyalty to the United States. One of these men was my great uncle, Kazuo Kadiyama. He was a member of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a segregated Japanese American unit. They risked their lives and fought honorably. The 442nd is the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the history the U.S. military. This is my grandma, Sachiko Kadiyama. She is 90 years old. She grew up on a farm in Platteville, Colorado, and had to work on the farm while my great uncles went to war. This is the photo of my great uncles. My grandma lived through the Great Depression, World War II, the executive, and the Executive Order 9066. She's seen the history of the U.S. from Pearl Harbor to 9-11, from the first television to the first smartphone, from the polio vaccine to the coronavirus vaccine. Throughout all these events in history, immigrants and people of color are often blamed and attacked over global events they have no control over. Even now, hate crimes against Asian Americans in major cities have increased by 150%. They are mostly targeted towards women and the elderly, like my grandma. I'm proud to be Asian and American. I'm proud of my great uncle who fought in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And I'm proud of my grandma and great aunt. Being Asian American makes me unique and different. The United States is a nation of immigrants and we all have qualities that make us unique. Our unique qualities should be celebrated instead of attacked. Stop Asian hate. Black Lives Matter. Thank you.
<laughs> thank, you. thank you thank you so much that's our show for today um it was a great one and i appreciate everybody who uh who was here through it i appreciate all the performers and contributors and robin and Sinazay museum of art thank you so much yes. for this opportunity yes. we do too. we're very very grateful thank you so much everybody <laughs> <laughs> How powerful was that, though? I mean, uh, oh, that's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yes, thank you all for making this happen. Thank you to all of you, too. And hopefully, next year, in person. <laughs> yes. yes. Coming back, coming back slowly, coming back together again as people are comfortable. So, yes. Yes. And yes. I will also say, regardless of media, if you are interested <laughs> in uh, contributing uh, to Play on Words in any way, um, whether through its wonderful association with the San Jose Museum of Art or just independently, we accept submissions on a rolling basis. We're always eager um, for new talent and new stories and uh, opportunities to advocate and represent uh, different points of view. And um, we, again, accept if you want to perform, if you're a writer, if you're just starting out, if you're established, it doesn't matter. Uh, email us at playonwordssj at gmail.com and uh, let us know. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening. It's great Thank to. You guys. Okay. <laughs> 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Have a great weekend and happy Juneteenth. Yes.